Good evening and welcome back to our first OKS King's Talk after Easter. As most of you will know, my name is Greg Hunter and I'm the Deputy Head Coach Curricular at King's. We are privileged to welcome back to King's five times Olympian, four times world champion and three times Olympic silver medalist, Frances Holton. Frances will be telling us about what she has learned from experiences of competing at the very highest level. Joining her will be former King's teacher and fellow rower, Rory Riley. After their discussion, we will be taking questions from you, the audience. Please either type your question into the Q&A function as part of Zoom at any time, or alternatively, after their discussion, put your virtual hand up and we can put you live on the air to ask us a question yourself or Francis. Now, it's with great pride and pleasure, I pass you over to Rory at the moment, who's a county down in Ireland, and Francis at from a home in Cornwall. Thanks, Rory, it's over to you now. Thanks, Greg. Hi, Francis. Good evening, Rory. I hope it's as sunny with you as it is with me at the moment. It is, it is. Oh, lovely, lovely. Well, I was, I was actually trying to remember uh, dates and um, incidents um, from way back. And I, I had identified one particular regatta and I thought, yes, this is, this is the one to talk about. And then I realized that the date of that regatta just did not match with your rowing career at all. So I've given up on that completely. So I, I suppose the inevitable first question has to be, when, when you think of Kings, what jumps into your mind? Uh, and then sort of what memories do you bring back from your time at Kings? Yeah, th thanks, Rory. Um, yeah, sometimes I get the wrong century when I'm trying to remember yeah. <laughs> which races I did, which is awkward. Um, so many memories from Kings. Um, and the ones that really stand out are, I think there are, there are three aspects. Um, the first one is the friendships that I made in my house, Walpole. You know, the, the 10 girls that I shared those five years with. And, you know, we're from such a a mix of backgrounds, really different personalities, but we've gone on to do such diverse things. And I really have a sense that we gave each other this permission to pursue what we were interested in. And you know, one's gone on to be a photographer, I carried on in sport, we have a designer, we've got a barrister, all sorts of different things. And I'm sure there's an, a little tiny bit in there that you know we could see in each other that we, we were interested in these different things and to give each other that permission to keep pursuing it and that support was really special. And it continues today, you know, you know, sharing WhatsApp messages today as a group. And I think that's really special about Kings to, to be able to forge those friendships that really last the test of time. Um, and then the second thing is the, the memories from my teammates in rowing, because I arrived at Kings and I was, really keen oh here we go <laughs> here are some of my here are some of my teammates and they taught me how to row and it was my first experience of you've got Lucy Heiser there um, on the left and we went through the junior ranks together and I just remember she passed on everything that she knew about rowing to me and I was so fortunate to come into a boat club that was up and running um, with such generous, generous people with their knowledge and their enthusiasm. So that, that was really special. And it continues now with the support of the Pilgrims, the OKS um, rowing uh, sort of contingent and association. And we can meet up at Henley each year. And again, to have those lasting friendships and, and contact to, to share and, and keep making memories is, is brilliant. Um, and the third thing about Kings is that it was where I made this first vow to myself that I wanted to try and get to the Olympics. Um, and it was actually at the, the school boat club dinner. And uh, Nick Strange, who was an OKS, he came back from the Atlanta Olympics and told us what an incredible experience it had been. And I remember sitting there and I just thought, this is, this is what I want to do. And I got the menu card, we were in St. Augustine's, turned it over and wrote on it, I vow to do everything I can to get to Sydney 2000 and I signed it, and that's what was my real focus. So that's kind of where it started. Mm. 
Yeah, it, it's it. I, I often wondered, you know, did King's help to actually um, map out the direction, or or whether it was just there as 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 background. But I mean, I mean, the thing that the thing that's even some people won't fully appreciate is the fact that you have been rowing and racing at international level for about twenty two years. Now, I mean, does that feel as extraordinary as it sounds? I mean, for, mo for most of us, rowing is a relatively short episode. Um, I mean, was yours more of, of a career in some ways? Yeah, I do see it now that it was a career. I think it took me a long time to make that adjust adjustment in my own mind from this is something I enjoy and I'm essentially choosing my favourite subject and doing PE and allowed to do it all day, every day, to thinking actually... There are good days and bad days in this and I am being paid to make sure I deliver results and that's a really different dynamic and I still enjoyed it but it was a you carry a lot more pressure to perform and it's not all about you and your own fun when it does become your career and other things drop away so for me it, it was a combination of enjoyment and ambition and the balance of the two ebbed and flowed. And I think it started off as enjoyment, then there was a lot of ambition. And I think towards the end, I think I brought back more enjoyment into what I was trying to do at the very end at my fifth games. Um, but no, I, when I set out, I certainly didn't think I'd be doing it for that long. <laughs> and how, I, I was gonna say, how do you move on from that? How did you move on from that? Because of course, we're now, we're now five years on from, uh, from Rio. So uh, I mean, did you move on sort of successfully from that? You know, there was, there was a, a whole period in your life where somebody else was dictating almost what time you got up in the morning, what you ate, what you did, how much activity you did, almost how much sleep you should have. And, and then how do, you, how do you move on from that? Yeah, it's such a good question. <laughs> I don't know if I have moved on. I do know that, as you say, I'm so conditioned to the structure and the discipline. And, you know, you asked earlier, you know, did Kings instill it in me or where did it come from? And I was born into a prep school boarding house. My parents were, my dad was a teacher and they ran a boarding house. So from very early on, I got the picture of have a plan, do it <laughs> each day. Um, and I think, you know, how do you move on? I, I kind of describe it that I'm gradually unwinding myself and deconditioning myself. And to I see it that rowing, the, all the goals that I had in rowing, that's not a goal to be replaced. It's a foundation to build upon now. And just to try and build and take, take the learnings that I got from rowing into life now. And what I find really interesting is that people, many people assume, oh, they must be about having really, you know, high standards and working really hard and, you know, push, push, push. But actually the thing that I learned when I really look back over my performances and, and really tried to assess what actually made the difference and what worked to produce performance was that it was doing the fundamental basics exceptionally well each day <laughs> over and over again. So that's one of the main things I try and do now is just make sure I've got that scaffolding each day of the fundamental basics of getting enough rest, of doing things to the best of my ability, but you know, eating well and having a plan and you know, mapping things out, being realistic and just doing things step by step. And although that might seem like, oh, you've lost your ambition, Actually, I just know from experience that is what made the made me make the most progress in anything that I was doing. And if that applies to trying to win the Olympic gold medal, then surely it's a valid approach to every day. So therefore, do you do you actually do you try to measure success now? Because in, 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 in a way, you know, for years you were measuring success or perhaps you might argue other people were, but no, you would have been as well. You were measuring success in a particular way. And, you know, what, what is your measurement gauge now? Or, or, or is that just simply a pointless idea? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I, I've come to realize that what people call success is the external interpretation of what they see from the outside 
and it doesn't reflect what the actual internal lived experience of that is either in the everyday of pursuing it or in the moment of you know standing on a podium it's it's not what it it doesn't feel like what it looks like on the outside and this is something that I really worked on um, about two years out from Rio 2014 I you know for up to that point I had been pursuing winning and it was all about gold you know from the moment I got back from Sydney I said to myself I want to be the first woman in rowing to go to five Olympic Games and I want to win Olympic gold. And from absolutely every day, it was about winning. But I got to this point in 2014, I hadn't won, other women had, and that was fantastic, but I hadn't fulfilled what I thought I should have fulfilled and I knew was the expectation on me. And I remember I was, you know, I was burnt out, I was injured. And I thought, I really have to look back and assess the way that I'm approaching this because this is making me ill, it's making me injured, it's, I'm not that fun to be in a team with. So actually, what is it that works and what is it that's most rewarding? And that's when I changed, I deliberately changed my definition of what would be success um, in Rio from, you know, I've got to win gold to what can I create together with the other people that I'm with. And if I can stand on that Olympic podium with my arms around my teammates and feel joy at what we've created and not relief, just short, just relief that it's over, then that would be the ultimate feeling. So I changed from focusing on the medal to how I would feel. And uh, so this is a, yeah, this is a photo of us in Rio. And we did get to jump up and down with Joy, one silver. Um, and I'd won silver in Beijing and, I, and, and that was a disappointment. And I was pretty sure that if we'd won gold in Beijing, we would have been relieved because there was, we put so much expectation on ourselves and it was all about that gold medal. Whereas this was about, we created, we worked together, we created something together. And this was us celebrating what we had created. So what you asked about, success and how I view it and because I experienced this changing my mindset and realizing that it was so much more enjoyable to focus on creating something with other people and having a really open mindset about I don't know where that's going to lead to but this is where my mindset is going to be each and every day um and realizing actually halfway through that final in Rio we were we well at halfway we were coming last and then two minutes later we were we were catching up on the Olympic champions and we didn't overtake them we won silver but I suddenly realized in that moment that changing the way that I thought of as success had been not only more enjoyable but it was much much faster than I could ever have perceived it would have been, or I even thought I could possibly be again. So I guess now the way that I take that into my life now and I see success is, is not to be drawn into what is typically seen as success and you know the all about the outcome. And I really focus on you know who I'm working with and what we can create together because you just don't know where it's going to lead. Mm. What I love about this photograph is, apart, apart from what it means, is the fact when you actually look across it, you expect to see Francis there with at least half a head higher than anybody else, and you realise that there are other very tall girls in that boat. <laughs> there are, and um, Zoe, who's the cox on the far right, she, she always tells this story about, you know, every, we were all jumping up and down, and of course our feet, are, well, most of our feet are on the ground, and she's got no hope at all. <laughs> <laughs> and what were the... You, I mean, you've hinted at that. That obviously was a huge high in, in terms of your career. And I, I, I have spoken to you before about watching that final and, and feeling that the, the race when I watched it first, God, it went on forever. And, and I was not feeling great at the, at the halfway mark. And um, the, you it, weren't it, feeling great. <laughs> it turned out rather better anyway. But um, what were, what were the other highs? And, and, and perhaps also you've hinted a bit about the, the 
in, in a way, the failure to win a gold medal at Beijing is almost being a low. I mean, imagine anybody saying that winning a silver medal is a, is a, is a low. But what, what were the other sort of highs and lows in, in the career in, during those 22 years? Yeah, um, so the Rio crew was very special, um, largely because I'd kind of, I'd let go of, you know, pushing myself so hard and, and it was a great experience to do that. Um, Athens in 2004, that was a wonderful crew as well. We had um, myself and um, Debbie and Rebecca, who I rode with there, we were this, exactly the same age and we'd come up through the junior system together. And so we had, we, we knew each other very well. The fourth member of the crew, Alison, was um, much older than us, but probably <laughs> twice as much fun because she'd got to the point where she was, you know, focused on making sure it was enjoyable as well. Um, and it was a really special, special crew. It was Bond. It was um, really incredible rowing. And if I ever dream about the rowing that we did in that crew, that that's a that's a good night because it was, it was, it was a crew that, and a team that stitched together the very best of everything we did in practice on the day when the light went green. And I think if you can experience that in any walk of life of actually stitching together the very best bits all in one go, that's that's really special. And of course, Rebecca went on the following Olympic Games to win gold in the individual cycling uh, pursuit, three or well, one K um, cycling. So she, she was an amazing athlete to be with. Um, in terms of lows, yeah, Beijing was a bit of a low, not, not delivering the gold that was expected of us, uh, but it taught me so much. You know, I think to, I remember coming in from the race and sitting on the side of the lake and I think one of us pushed another one of, you know, the other one in and, you know, we ended up in a heap of, of laughter. And I think if you can experience a day like that where you have failed and you failed in front of millions of expectant spe um, spectators and friends and family who've come out to watch and yet you can share that moment and laugh with each other then you've you've still experienced a, a really um a really important thing to have done to to know between each other how hard you've pushed yourselves um i really i still really value it now as an experience and i'm still really proud of what we did so yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't a great day, but the good things came from it. Um, I, the, I think the most heart-wrenching memory I have from all over my career was crossing the line in Beijing and having this sense in my stomach that if only I could turn the clock back six and a half minutes, just stick, give me the last six and a half minutes again and I'll do it differently, but you can't. Mm -hmm so um yeah that but you know the other, other crews were, were talented as well so yeah certainly um do you think did you have did you have role models or mentors you know who who inspired you i mean not necessarily even in 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 the in the rowing sense but perhaps uh, more generally in in terms of life yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I really struggle with this one because I didn't really have, you know, rowing idols that I wanted to be specifically like that person. But I drew a lot from lots of different people in sport and outside of sport, different walks of life. And actually, I, you know, I I just listened to a lot of Desert Island Discs because it's amazing to hear people who have persevered and persevered done a variety of different things often it's a it's a winding path to get to where they've got to to the point where that you know they're that they're asked to become on, on desert island discs and i remember one in particular uh, i was listening to nicola benedetti who's a um, concert violinist and she talked about the her what she her moment of performance and she talked about the difference between concentration and thinking and that when she's up there on the stage you've got to be completely in the moment and concentrate on what you're doing not start thinking about it or thinking about what's coming next or thinking about the environment around you and I remember that really landed with me and that's I think a really good example of the way that I took things from different walks of life because we really used that in the cruise that I was in after that because I was 
you know, absolutely adamant, like when, when we're in the race, we've got to keep concentrating on what we're doing. Don't start thinking about the end or don't start thinking about how you can go faster or how you'd really rather not be in this much pain. Um, and, you know, it's a really good um, thing, I think, to use, you know, in everyday life as well. It's so easy to get distracted. Um, so I, I really think there's so much to be drawn from all sorts of different people. And, that, and that's one of the sources that I used, um, Desert Island Discs. There's a nice, <clears throat> nice question that's just popped in from Llewellyn Hines. How do you convince younger athletes to find the fun in sport rather than focus on victory alone? Yeah, that it's true, especially if they start out with wanting to win rather than my way around was I started out just really enjoying it. And then the winning carrot came along. Um, I, I would. So for me, it was when I pressed pause in my career and I look back and I reminded myself actually the bits that I really value about this and the things that I want more of in the last bit of my years that I've got left are the days that I've enjoyed. So I think it's worth sitting down with those young athletes and saying, okay, today went well or today didn't go, go badly. What are the bits that you actually would like more of? And then move on from there. So, like, okay, well, what do we want to replicate? Do we want more good days? Okay, what makes up a good day? Yeah, interesting. There's um, a, a number of questions have come in. I think um, Sissy Williamson ha has been um, just chatting to the rowers. Um, and, and an interesting one here from her. At what point did you realize that rowing was more than a casual sport? Oh, um... It's a good question. I do remember sitting down with my parents on the Walpole lawn after a parents meeting and everyone had said, well, you know, she's doing all right, but she does spend a lot of time away rowing. <laughs> and my parents said, this is not why we sent you to this school. <laughs> <laughs> We'd really like you to spend less time concentrating on rowing. And I remember, you know, stamping my foot and saying, I think I'm actually all right at this. Um, so certainly, you know, as a teenager, I knew that there was something there that was worth pursuing. Um, but it was as much enjoyment as evidence, I'd say. Um, but I think the thing that Kings did for me was they sowed seeds of, you know, do you realize that this could be possible? Do you realize that you, you know, keep persevering at this because, you know, the, there's the stuff at the end of this that could be worth, worth going for. And then it was up to me to keep knocking on the door. Um, I remember hanging out outside the staff common room every, every morning break to wait for the boat club keys um, so that I could go and do an extra session before everyone else. And so I, I think at the school, it was the, the sowing the seeds and then the facilitation of it. It was up to me to keep asking, but the answer was always, Yes, if it was at all possible. Yeah, another uh, lovely, lovely one. I, I, I wondered, um, following Rio, do you prefer sculling or sweeping? This comes from another of the of the boat club members. Uh, well, actually, I prefer sweeping, which which is a bit annoying since I spent most of my time sculling. Um, I really enjoyed single sculling, um, but in a com in a comp competition environment, it's actually just really stressful and you're on your own, you've got no one to share the nerves with. <laughs> um, and sweep or rowing, I, I just really, I love the simplicity of having one oar and yet the complexity of working with someone else. You, you, you just, you cannot go straight without working in complete harmony with someone else. And you've got to let your ego go because otherwise you, you are not going to stay going forwards, so, or backwards. Um, so yeah, I really, really like sweet brewing. Um, Charles Fonette, oh. oh, there is an evening Francis. Many athletes struggle with race day pre-erg nerves, sometimes to the point that they choke and underperform. You've always struck me as a very confident racer and appearances are half the battle. Was there a technique you and your various crews used to overcome fear? And the same question has actually come through from Sissy as well. Um, what do you do to calm your nerves before competition? 
<laughs> hi Charles, hi Sissy. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Actually, I talk quite a lot about this in, um, so I've, I've compiled all my learnings from rowing in, in a sort of little notebook. And uh, uh, nerves, someone pointed out to me that nerves is one of the longer chapters. <laughs> so clearly I spent a lot of time working on it. Um, I, it was always really important to me to not overthink it, that like you've done the preparation. And I always knew that if I could just walk up as if it was a normal day and just almost like roll through it. And it never made sense to me when coaches said, you know, you should raise your game for the day. That didn't work for me. I needed to keep doing today what I've done every other day and to execute what is inside of me. And I think one of those questions was a bit, you know, about how we approached it as a team. And the thing that I really tried to bring to the last team I was in was an absolute assurance that what was inside of us already was enough. Not to try and seek more on the day, not mm. to try and pull something out of a hat, not to do something magical, but we are enough as we are. And if we can give each other permission just to be ourselves, to express it ourselves fully, we are our most powerful as our natural selves. So we can give that to each other, permission to be ourselves, an absolute belief that what we are in this moment is enough. Yeah, there's lots of questions coming through. How do you motivate yourself to get up and train hard every day, even though you may not have felt like it? That's from Oscar Farthing. Well, that was an everyday thought when yeah. the alarm went off. When do I next get to go back to sleep? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, those vows that I made to myself, so the one that I made in St. Augustine's to, to try and get to Sydney, and then when I came back, um, the vow to try and be the first woman to get to five games and, and so on, it was when 99% of me felt like I couldn't do it anymore. And that was on many days, I'm not gonna lie, many days I thought I couldn't carry on. Those vows to myself, they were the 1% that kept putting the keys in the ignition. And I just wouldn't let go. Um, and so I think if you can have something really clearly articulated that you want to get out of what you're doing, then it can keep pulling you through. Here's a nice one. Josephine Patterson. What was your most memorable race at Kings? Oh, my most memorable, gosh, there are so many. Um, well, I had one where I was, when I was very young and I was put with, you probably had a hand in this, Rory. <laughs> I was in the removes or the shells or something and you put me in with the best rower in the school and she was really good and really experienced and we rode at Women's Henley and I crashed us straight into the booms. No, that was Martin Lawrence, that was his fault. <laughs> right, thanks. <laughs> Fortunately, I managed to pull ourselves together. It's amazing what you can do in a time of stress. <laughs> and um, yeah, we came through, but yeah, it was good. It was a, there's a strange one that sits in my mind. And, and it, it's funny when I look back on, on crews that I coached and so on, and both uh, Richard Hooper and I were sort of uh, coaching you at, at, at one point and we went off to uh, national schools and Debbie, who you mentioned earlier, beat you in, in, the, in the final of national schools. And I was, I was really cross with myself um, for that. But, but yes, it's... Uh, I mean, it was probably irrelevant what I felt about, about you having won or, or, or lost to Debbie. Um, but it is strange how, how we do remember certain uh, particular races. Um, Chris Elworthy, Francis, I remember you being so relentlessly determined at school. Do you think determination required to become an Olympian is nature or nurture? Uh, I don't think, I think it's both. I think that the common denominator I saw in the athletes that made it to the top and in whatever way you want to see that, but, you know, made it to the top of the podium, the common denominator was that they kept getting up when they failed. So whether that was on, you know, a daily basis or after big results, they moved quickest from that bit where you're really annoyed with yourself, where you feel like you've let other people down or something didn't work that you tried to what they were going to do about it. So they would move quickest from judgment to action. And that is what I saw over and over and over again, because to get to the top, it is like doing failure on repeat. 
and you've just got to keep picking yourself up. And actually, Greg, I've got that timeline, haven't I, over my career of the ups and downs. And this is actually accurate to what, you know, what actually happened during my career. And there are so, there are as many downs as up. And you, and I know it's a cliche, but you learn so much more from it not going right, as long as you take the steps to learn and you are really proactive in that moment of saying, okay, that went wrong. What did I do wrong? What am I gonna, what did I do right? And I'm gonna keep doing, what did I do wrong? And I'm gonna learn from, and I'm gonna discard and move, you know, and move on from. Uh, so yeah, so that, that is a, a true to, a true to what happened, um, ups and downs of my career. Um, and I'm sure I wouldn't have reached that high point in Rio without that low point of frustration and burnout and reflection uh, two years before, because I needed to have that because things weren't working. Yeah, interesting. There's a, a, another question, an anonymous one. Um, this this relates I, I i remember having a conversation uh, a number of years ago uh, and and the whole tone of the conversation was about the fact most most uh, rowing coaches the ones who were who were really the big time rowing coaches a they're male and b they're on their own but this question says did such a competitive profession impact your personal life and relationships and i think that may be hinting at, at a negative but actually I mean, well, it's up to you. Turn it around any way you like. What do you think? Well, I was actually about to turn it around because when I met my partner, Steve, in 2012, people said, you know, at last you've started smiling. <laughs> and, you know, there's something else in your life and you're not taking it quite so seriously. And he really supported me and helped me to see things really quite differently and, you know, enabled me to reflect more on, on how I was behaving and and what I really wanted out of what I was doing you know he's, he's a tennis coach and runs a tennis center down here in Newquay and tennis is a very different sport because they actually are interesting they do all their technique when they're youngsters and then they um, build their physical ability in their late teens and then they do their match ability their mental toughness whereas in rowing we work on on the same on all three of those from the beginning like every stroke we're trying to like work on all three so it was just really refreshing to have a different perspective um and it was really good for me to have a personal balance to my life and i remember must have been i went through a bit of a dodgy patch in my performances from about 2011 to about 2015 and a half and uh, I remember I did a, I did a really good result, random really good result in one of the national trials. And I phoned Steve and I said, I'm so excited. You know, it's you know, it's possible. I could, you know, I could make it back again. It's not all lost. And he said, Yes, but Arsenal lost today, and that's awful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> in perspective. Wonderful. You like this one? A certain Lucy Casanova. Ah. Hi, Francis. Hi, Rory. It's Lucy Heiser here. Hello. What is on your horizon for Francis version 2.0? <laughs> What's on my horizon? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, as someone with three children, Lucy, you'll appreciate this. I've just taken on two dogs and all I want to do is get to the end of the, each day and make sure they're still alive because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, yeah, I'm building a life in Cornwall. Um, I do some mentoring with athletes that are, um, you know, going to Tokyo or looking towards Paris. And yeah, a combination of trying to build on my experiences, uh, working with sports to ensure that the environment that they're building is not only going to work in, in terms of you know great athletic performances but that the athletes themselves and the coaches and the support staff really enjoy it so i i work with uk sport on a you know on a, with culture mental health um how they define winning and what it takes to win things like that um yeah and just gradually adapting myself to not being having quite such high standards about every day <laughs> And uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a very nice, nice question um, here from one of the pupils, um, again through Sissy. Um, 
How did you balance your academics with rowing, especially during exams? And that is so pertinent to what's happening to them right now, because I think I'm, I'm very aware that kids are being pushed through these teacher um, assessed grades, which actually means you have to do tests in geography and maths and English and so on almost every day of the week at the moment in order, in order to justify the grades that they will get this year. But how did you balance academics and rowing? Right, so number one, I, when I made that vow about going to Sydney, I also said to myself, right, whilst I'm still at school, my A-levels are my priority and I will fit as much rowing as I can around that. But the, that, the, the work I need to do, the school work I need to do, that box has to be fully ticked before I work out what the rowing training I can do around it is. And then when I said, well, so I'll do that. And then when I get to university, I've got one year to try and get to Sydney. And then I will make a, a more even balance of at work and how much training I do. But I would give one piece of, well, two pieces of advice um, in that I can see now that what really is so important is to get enough sleep. Like people ask me all the time, what's this big recovery method? What did you do? Did you do ice bars? Did you eat something? Did you all these supplements? You know, what was the magic trick to, to making sure that you could perform and you could recover? And whether it's mentally or physically, sleep is the number one thing. So I would say, get your, get your, just make sure, if your thing can be, make sure I get to bed and get the regeneration time so that you can you can just keep going. I think that's really, really important. And around that and, and linked to that is, if it works for trying to get an Olympic gold medal, I'm sure it applies to, you know, this, the challenge that you've got of this continued assessment. And that is keep doing the fundamental basics exceptionally well. Keep looking after yourself, keep making, being realistic about what you can do in each day, eat well, and make sure you get some off time as well, because your brain is like your like the muscles in your legs and your arms. They need to recover in order to perform. So fundamental basics. If you can do the fundamental basics exceptionally well, you are going to give yourself the best chance of finding out what you can do. It's interesting. I, I lived in, um, during my rowing days, I lived in a, a house in Clapham, which was owned by um, a, a world gold medalist. And there was only one rule in the house in terms of behaviour. <laughs> and the behaviour was not always great. And so there were a number of us li living in the house. But uh, Chris's one rule was that at 10 o'clock at night, everything shut down. And there was to be total silence in the house. And that silence wasn't broken until eight o'clock in the morning. If anybody wanted to get up early, they did it quietly. Anyway, Josephine Patterson, what would you say made a great coach or perhaps makes a great coach? Um, so what makes a not great coach is the one that looks at you and sees in you a line on their CV. And what makes a great coach, I think, is the one that is interested rather than frustrated and that doesn't pass on the emotional stress that they are feeling. You know, I think the, the, what I found very, very difficult was if, if a coach was really, really disappointed in me and say, well, if you're disappointed, imagine how disappointed I am and I don't want to carry your disappointment as well. So don't pass stress on and you're in it together. What I really love, the, the, what I, you know, and, and yourself, Rory, you taught me this, was we're, we're doing this together. We're finding out what we can do together and let's enjoy it together. And, um, you know, this is something that we're creating as, you know, a partnership. And what I absolutely loved was be able to get to the end of a race. And I did this in Athens, actually, the Athens Olympic final. I crossed the line. It was my first international medal. I'd won the Olympic silver medal. And 
all I'd been thinking all the way down this course was must keep my arms straight because my university coach always said, you've got to keep your arms straight. So the first thing I did when I crossed the line was look up into the stands and try and see his face in the crowd and to ask him, were they straight enough? I just want your approval that they were straight enough. Um, but that's, you know, to have that bond with someone and to be able to then come off your race and look them in the eye, look each other in the eye and say, yeah, we did that together. That was you know, great, great effort is, I, I think that's what's really special about coaching. And, and what about, what about the book? What, <laughs> what was the, um, what's the motivation there in, in, I've, uh, I've read it, I've gone through it a couple of times just to, to see, see what's in there. What was, what was your motivation in, in doing, doing that, writing that? Yeah, so the book Learnings from Five Olympic Games, it is what it says on the tin. And the motivation was, I knew that I had stuff of real value that I could pass on. And to keep carrying it around in my head just felt too heavy. <laughs> so, so I've got to get this out of my head. Um, and I wanted to pass it on, you know, partly to coaches and support staff, doctors, friends, family, who'd really helped me get over the last sort of couple of years of my career. Um, as I, you know, I wanted to give it to them as a gift. Um, and as it turns out, I've made it publicly available and it's been popular, shall we say. Um, and it's, for me, whilst I was rowing, one of my roles in the boat was to distill everything that we had been working on into our race plan. And so what I wanted to do was produce something that distilled all my learning from over these 21 years that I had really tried to bring together in a really succinct and pragmatic way for that last crew I was in in Rio. Um, and when I when we were coming last and then when we came through to win the silver in Rio, I realized that because I had deliberately changed my mindset and it had worked, it had not only been more enjoyable, it had been faster. I thought, this is a story I've got to tell because I've really tried to pass on these learnings and it's worked. <laughs> so um, it's just a real need in me to, to articulate this and um, you know, bring it together in the really practical chapters. Um, so actually I've just, you know, I started with uh, teams and then I think I talk about racing and nerves and daily training and injury. And each chapter is just really practically what I found when I experienced, um, when I was trying to create the best performance that I could. Um, so it's like, I get people say it's like stumbling across an Olympian's notebook. Um, and it's what I, the ingredients for me of creating the ultimate race, both the practical stuff and the much more um, personal, emotional stuff that you need to get right, because you can do all the training in the world, but when you get on that start line, you are only human and you have to control your nerves and um, you're in there with other people and it's all about yourself as a person and the other people that you're with. Um, so yeah, it's been brilliant. And um, I've posted worldwide. Um, I think one day I had an order from Bondi Beach and the next order was from an oil rig um, off the Orkneys. <laughs> so it's going everywhere. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a little, little thing. There's, um, <laughs> little through my website. A certain person that I remember is an absolute terrier in a boat ben loxton edwards ben is now i think a leader of the pilgrims um fantastic interview can you see these questions it is 25 years since your epic king's quad of 1996 will you join us in saint augustine's with the rest of that crew on the 18th of september ah the school boat club dinner when is it Rory? the 18th well it of says september. the 18th the 18th of september that's we'll, the we'll... day before my birthday well what a great day to, <laughs> what a great day to have a celebration Will, will we all be allowed to travel by then? Well, let's hope so. Uh, well, at um, least two of us are on the call anyway. So Lucy Casano was in that crew as well. Um, yes, I think we, I think Lucy and I were in a double and then we had the quad, um, four of us, a yeah, very successful year. And that's, you know, it just played such a huge part in my career to have the privilege to row with people who were better than me and older than me and prepared to pass on um, what they knew to me. It's worth, I, I'm, I'm going to put um, really a, a shameless plug um, for the pilgrims, and, and it wasn't just the pilgrims, it was, this is partly what happened um, 
in terms of the school as, as well, when, when you left or when you were about to leave, one of the things that um, a, a number of people were concerned about was that you would have to go to a particular club. You would have to go to the club that would provide you with the right sort of equipment and so on. And the pilgrims put their hands in their pockets and essentially sent you away from school with an empacker sculling boat. And that allowed you to take yourself and your boat and your blades to where you wanted to go. And it's been, um, yeah, I, 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 was, I was really proud of what the, what the pilgrims did and, and the school backed it in, in fairness yeah. as well. It was invaluable because, you know, it meant that, as you say, I could go anywhere and I was self-sufficient and I did go to the University of London, but I, I had, my, had my own ways yeah. and means. And because I was on it, I really wanted to accelerate my pathway, it was, you know, I couldn't have done it without that support from the pilgrims. And I know that they're introducing a rowing scholarship, I think, Rory, uh, for a sixth former, I think. And you, just to have that aid, you, you don't know where it's gonna lead, but it, it makes something possible that otherwise would not be possible. And I would not have gone on to do what I did without that support. Another, another name has just popped up. Maddie Simpson, does that mean anything to you? Maybe after my time. No, Maddie Morgan. She huh? says, no question, just a hello from me. Maddie Morgan to you both. So proud of all you've achieved, Francis. Oh, thank you. Um, Oscar, Oscar Farthing, who was on earlier, he wants a signed copy of your book. He says he has to go to bed. I don't believe him. <laughs> no problem. Um, the, the, uh, the, final, the final question from me is uh, one of the things about rowing is you end up with lots of medals and trophies and photos and so on. And so what hangs on your wall and why? Right, well, it doesn't hang, hang in, on my wall, but it does live in an Olympic sock because we get so many socks. That's where I keep the special things, in an Olympic sock. And I don't know if many people know that every Olympian gets a medal, a participant's medal. And so my participant's medal from Sydney is the thing that I'm proudest of, of everything. And that's the thing that I would say from the Burning House. Um, I, I came last in Sydney, but I got this amazing medal to commemorate the fact that I got there. And I was so proud to become an Olympian and just be a part of the team. So my participants medal from Sydney. Fantastic. There's a, a note <clears throat> just through from Jeremy Frank, something I didn't know. Um, the OKS Masonic Lodge also contributed to that sculling boat. And uh, Jeremy was the master at the time. So thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Um, one from Llewellyn Hines. You mentioned the ability to control your nerves was critical as a record-breaking athlete on the ergometer. How closely linked is physical power to boat speed and race performance? Are there, or are there other dominating factors? And if so, what are they? Gosh, there's a lot there. Well, I'll leave you with one simple thought. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> so if you have a huge ergo, you're very powerful, or translate it to any other form of life, that comes with great responsibility. Thank you, Francis. And a thank you from Henry Merch, who's just come through as well. I think over to you, Greg. Look, Rory Francis, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Rory, for your time in, uh, in interviewing and, and just doing it very easily and making us feel like we're just in your living rooms, collective living rooms, sitting down and having a chat about life, the universe and everything else. Um, Francis, yeah, I, I've just taken down a few notes, so excuse me. I mean, uh, excuse me, just while we, I relive some of your talk there, actually. Um, and there were some guiding principles for all of us to live by, really, doing the fundamental basics exceptionally well and, and, and ap absolutely crucial. Don't worry about this and that and everything else. Just do the basics really well. Eat well, sleep well. If you can do all those different things, you know, do those basics well, then actually it's, it's half the battle. Um, I love the way you talked about the change in the definition of success, actually, you know, and, and, and I think it, once you get a bit older, like me and maybe Rory, maybe Rory, um, um, 
you, you realize, and you too, Francis, I'll, I'll bring you on this one as well. You, you realize actually you don't have to stop trying to reach that pinnacle, reach that pinnacle, reach that pinnacle, and that's it's got to be the success. I've got to get there. And actually, this the success is just about enjoying the journey and the process of the journey with the people you're doing it and as being a part of a team. That is when you when you learn that, and that's absolutely crucial. That actually enjoy that, and that's very much you know a huge part of the success. And hearing you talk about the journey, um, it was lovely to hear you talk about King sowing the seeds. And really, if I can say, you know allowing you to dare to dream so you know and and you know I'll, I'll leave on that sort of note of allowing you know i certainly hope our king's pupils who are still here have that ability to dare to dream that the seeds are sown at kings and that and that they've got that ability to think i can make it to the very very pinnacle the way you have francis in in whatever you decide you you're, you're going to do so once again francis thank you very very much can i just give a big plug here i've got two things to show the first one we'll start with the oks magazine right magnificent publication uh, it's just been released. It's, this is the paper version. There's an electronic version as well. And if you thumb through the pages to, Francis, yeah, a bit like the sport always gets the back pages of the newspaper. If you thumb through the pages to page 52, you've got a, a, a wonderful sort of two, three page spread on, on, on Francis and, and from Warpole to Rio. Okay, so the OKS magazine, that one, but also the book that's been talked about tonight, Learning from Five Olympic Games, uh, only, I believe, available if you if you order directly from uh, www.francishorton.co.uk. And I believe also, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to, to, to type them in and write them in directly to, to Francis via that particular uh, particular um, uh, method. Also, a huge thank you, and it was mentioned just before, the Pilgrims, uh, Ben Loxton Edwards, for his efforts in helping to coordinate this talk as well. Through him, have we managed to get Francis here as well and Rory, um, and, you know, so his efforts. So thank you very much with your work at the Pilgrims and, and, and within the OKS. And finally, I'll just leave you with, uh, we're looking forward to our next King's Talk, um, which is uh, May the 6th, uh, uh, 7.45 uh, next week, um, which is a, a biotech startup, uh, 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 PED, Pet Medics uh, was start up, started up by Dr. Jolyon Martin, and he presents lessons learned from founding a biotech start. It would be a really fascinating talk and, and one to look forward to. But once again, thank you so much, Francis, and thank you so much, Rory, for your time. It was, it's been truly inspirational. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for, for, for joining us and, and have a very good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>